Hey folks, this is Riker with a gaming news wrap-up video where we discuss the happenings of the week. This week's topics include some concerning leaks about Diablo 4's development, a summary of the 2022 Game Awards, the FTC seeking to block the Microsoft acquisition of Activision Blizzard, and more. As always, discussion timestamps can be found in the description below, but right before you skip ahead, just a quick reminder to ring that sub notification bell to be alerted to new Saturday episodes and stay up to date with gaming news highlights. But before we move on, just a quick word from this video's sponsor, Squarespace. I built my website Riker.com using Squarespace, and I was able to do everything myself, quickly and easily, and with zero education in the field, all thanks to how easy Squarespace is to work with. Watch how easily I update my website to add a new section to embed my Diablo lore videos. Squarespace is flexible for any kind of website, whether for your business or your hobby, with tons of templates that you can easily customize to your needs, no knowledge of coding required. You can even connect your social media profiles to automatically push website content to your socials, set up members-only areas with exclusive content, and sell products. Basically, if you want to build a website, I recommend Squarespace. So, head to squarespace.com for a free trial, and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash Riker and use code Riker to save 10% off your first purchase of a website or domain. That's squarespace.com slash R-H-Y-K-K-E-R and use code Riker to get started today. In our first story, Dwarf Fortress released on Steam this week, and in just under 24 hours, it hit 160,000 sales, which is what some thought it would reach in two months. Steam reviews are overwhelmingly positive. In case you don't know, Dwarf Fortress is a roguelike settlement management game that's been around since 2006, and it came to fame because of its emergent gameplay and complex difficulty. There's so many systems and so much random and procedural generation that you're guaranteed to experience some hilarious outcome at some point. After all, the game's slogan has become, losing is fun. Oh, and possibly the best part about the Steam release? There is Steam Workshop integration for modding support. On OpenCritic, the game has an average review score of 90 out of 100, based on only 8 reviews, with 80% of critics recommending the game. Now the thing with Dwarf Fortress, <laughs> it's not the kind of game that you can recommend to just anyone. But for people who are interested by its premise, it's unquestionably the best game at doing what it does. Now another game released recently, horror game The Callisto Protocol. And unfortunately this one isn't shaping up to be as great as some of us would have hoped. It has a 71% on Open Critic, not a terrible score with only 47% of critics recommending it, however. And this is based on 92 critic reviews. On Steam, the game has mixed reviews. Though this is actually an improvement from mostly negative, there was performance issues on PC. Really, really, really bad ones. And the devs have since tried to fix it. They did improve the situation. That said, outside of performance issues, clunky combat seems to be a recurring complaint. And... Unfortunately, this game that we all want it to be the spiritual successor to Dead Space, since it's by the co-creator of Dead Space, isn't quite living up to the original. Here's to hoping that the Dead Space remake releasing next year will be able to scratch that itch. In some Activision Blizzard news, Microsoft's acquisition of the company is indeed being hindered by the Federal Trade Commission. The FTC is alleging, quote, that Microsoft would gain control of top video game franchises enabling it to harm competition in high-performance gaming consoles and subscription services by denying or degrading rivals' access to its popular content. Ouch. The FTC pointed to Microsoft's record, how they bought ZeniMax and thus Bethesda, and thereafter they made Bethesda's upcoming titles Microsoft exclusives despite previously assuring antitrust authorities that they had no reason to do such a thing. And those assurances were made less than two years ago. Now, what does this mean exactly? Is the deal going to be off? Well, the FTC is not taking the matter to federal court. They filed their complaint within their own administrative court. So this suggests that they're not actually looking to block the deal completely, but just rather get Microsoft to make concessions that will be legally binding, like having an actual contract to enforce not making Call of Duty exclusive to Xbox, as opposed to just pinky promising it. So as of right now, the deal still seems like it will be going through. Now, coincidentally, Microsoft announced this week a promise to bring Call of Duty to Nintendo consoles, 
and Steam for at least 10 years. And apparently they want to extend that same offer to Sony, but Sony allegedly refuses to sit down for talks. Meanwhile, Steam boss Gabe Newell said that the promise wasn't necessary. He told Kotaku, quote, Microsoft offered and even sent us a draft agreement for a long-term Call of Duty commitment. But it wasn't necessary for us because A. We're not believers in requiring any partner to have an agreement that locks them to shipping games on Steam into the distant future. B. Phil and the game team at Microsoft have always followed through on what they told us they would do, so we trust their intentions. And C. We think Microsoft has all the motivation they need to be on the platforms and devices where Call of Duty customers want to be. Basically, he's saying that Microsoft is a trustworthy company and that he believes in his product, Steam, enough that he believes it will continue to be a good business decision for Microsoft to release Call of Duty on Steam. Ironically, while Call of Duty has been on Steam for most of the franchise's life, new Call of Duty games had stopped releasing on Steam for a few years and just recently returned with Modern Warfare 2. Coincidence or not, this title broke sales records for the franchise. In some quick news, a new patch for ARPG Grim Dawn released this week. The game itself entered early access in 2013, saw its full release in 2016, had two expansions released by 2019, and by 2022 the game and its expansions had sold a combined total of 7 million copies. The team had confirmed that there would be no third expansion, and their current project is Farthest Frontier, a town-building game, though they have other projects in the works that haven't been revealed. Grim Dawn 2 does seem to be in some form of development, if only super, super early. Eleven months ago, the devs said that they were working on a new engine for Grim Dawn 2, and that new engines take time, and that they've got other projects that they're working on as well, taking time away from that. So while Grim Dawn 2 is nowhere in sight, it's still great to see Crate continuing to support the game. If you want to know more about Grim Dawn, you can check out my old video over here. The game frequently goes on sale on GOG. In other news, the new Path of Exile expansion launched last night, The Forbidden Sanctum. I haven't yet had a chance to check it out myself, but I'm also not seeing people complaining about it, and if they're not complaining about it, that's because they're playing. So, good sign. If you've played, go ahead and sound off in the comments with your thoughts. In other news, the Game Awards happened this week, and in addition to awards going out to a number of games, we got some new game reveals and world first trailers drop. So let's go over the highlights, shall we? We got the reveal of Hades 2, in which we'll play as the Princess of the Underworld and sister to Zagreus, Melano. It'll go into early access in 2023. The first Hades was an excellent game, I've got 8 hours logged myself and I need to log more. And while it's not the type of game I thought I would like, given it's a roguelite, I've really come to love it. We also got a reveal trailer for Armored Core 6, Fires of Rubicon, and it's actually invoking some Dark Souls vibes. Armored Core is a mech game from developer From Software, and the last major installment released in 2012. Since then, From Software's Dark Souls series really took off, so it wouldn't surprise me if this latest Armored Core is, in some way, guided by some design lessons learned throughout the rising success of From's Souls-like games. We also got the reveal of Death Stranding 2, and it looks like it'll be just as wonderfully weird as the first. We also got the reveal of Judas, a narrative-heavy game in development by Ghost Story Games, led by Ken Levine of Bioshock fame. And Judas is looking very Bioshocky. Bioshock was a spiritual successor to System Shock, and now Judas may be a spiritual successor to Bioshock. Hm. We also got a trailer for Suicide Squad Kill the Justice League, which reveals that Batman is in the game. A crazy killer Batman. And the trailer ended with a nice tribute to actor Kevin Conroy, who passed away recently and has been the voice of Batman since the animated series in the early 90s. His performance in Kill the Justice League is his final performance as Batman. We also got an announced trailer for Returnal coming to PC. The previously PlayStation exclusive released in 2021, and is a third-person roguelike sci-fi shooter that has been praised for its combat, visuals, and atmosphere. We also got a PC release date for The Last of Us. That'll be March 3rd. We got a new trailer for Baldur's Gate 3 and an official release date out of early access, August 2023. We got the official reveal trailer for Star Wars Jedi Survivor, which looks amazing. This is a sequel to Star Wars Jedi Fallen Order, 
and looks to be an even better version of that game. Jedi Survivor launches March 16th, 2023. We got a teaser trailer for Cyberpunk 2077's Phantom Liberty expansion. The big drop is that Idris Elba is in it, and damn is that a huge win. We can also see hints at the improved vehicle combat. And Dead Cells is getting a crossover DLC called Return to Castlevania, coming in the first quarter of 2023. Another highlight of mine was Al Pacino, yes, freaking Al Pacino, coming up on stage to give out the Best Performance of the Year award. Although, the poor guy was really struggling to read the teleprompter. He called out that he was having issues, and I'm really surprised that there were no greater precautions or failsafes taken to ensure that an 82-year-old man could read text 20 feet away from him, because it was actually getting painful to watch as nothing was done to save him. But whenever he went off script, he was delightful, and he got to give the award away to the voice of Teal'c, I mean Kratos, Christopher Judge, who was so overjoyed that he chased down Al Pacino to give him a hug, then went on to give an 8 minute acceptance speech, 8 minutes, before they started playing music over him, at which point he just started talking louder. I love Christopher Judge, and honestly at first, I thought that they must have told him, you know, by time, which is why his speech was going so long, but I think this was just, this was his moment. He seemed surprised to have won. He's had a long career, and he just seemed truly grateful and humbled. I would have sat through two hours of Christopher Judge talking. It's just a shame he didn't sneak in an indeed. All right, let's quickly go over now all the winners. Best mobile game went to Marvel Snap, which beat out Diablo Immortal, Genshin Impact, and others. It took me a moment to realize that the person accepting the award was Ben Brode, former Hearthstone game director. It was great to see him again and see that he has achieved success with another game. Best fighting game went to Multiverses. Best esports game was Valorant. Best family game went to Kirby and the Forgotten Land. Best debut indie went to Stray. Well deserved. Best adaptation was the League of Legends Arcane series on Netflix. Best narrative went to God of War Ragnarok. Best art direction was Elden Ring. We're going to see a lot of these names repeating now. Best VR AR game was Moss Book 2. Best Sim Strategy, Mario plus Rabbids Sparks of Hope. Best Community Support, Final Fantasy XIV. The Games for Impact Award went to As Dusk Falls. Best Sports Racing was Gran Turismo 7. Best Multiplayer went to Splatoon 3. The Innovation and Accessibility Award went to God of War Ragnarok, as did the Best Audio Design Award. Most Anticipated Game Award went to The Legend of Zelda, Tears of the Kingdom. Best Action Game was Bayonetta 3. Best score and music, God of War Ragnarok. Best RPG was Elden Ring. Best indie was Stray. Best action adventure was God of War Ragnarok. Best ongoing game was Final Fantasy XIV. Best direction was Elden Ring. And game of the year went to Elden Ring. And I'm very glad that it went to Elden Ring. God of War Ragnarok was amazing, but Elden Ring really pushed the envelope within its genre and brought the Souls-like game to a whole new audience and a whole new level. Oh, and something really weird happened during the Game of the Year Award acceptance speech. Some kid just walked up on stage with the Elden Ring devs. He hung around awkwardly, and then as the devs were leaving the stage, he came up and said, You know, real quick, I want to thank everybody and say that I think I want to nominate this award to uh, my Reformed Orthodox Rabbi Bill Clinton. Thank you, everybody. He was promptly hurried off stage and later arrested. In some Diablo 4 news, it leaked earlier this week that Diablo 4 would release on June 6th, and at the Game Awards, this was officially confirmed to be true. We also got an awesome cinematic at the Game Awards, along with a reveal of the pre-purchase bonuses and digital deluxe, collector's edition, all that. We have a full video discussing that right here. Now I do want to expand on one thing I mentioned in that video, and that's regarding the Battle Pass. I mentioned how the Ultimate Edition of Diablo 4 includes an accelerated Seasonal Battle Pass Unlock, which includes a premium Seasonal Battle Pass Unlock plus 20 tier skips and cosmetic. In my previous video I said this left room for an interpretation that there could be pay to win here. Now since then I've gone back and reread the monetization blog in which they discussed the Battle Pass. So let's recap. Diablo 4 has a battle pass with free tiers and premium tiers. You will earn a variety of rewards for free just by playing the game. At any point during a season, you can choose to purchase the premium pass to unlock the ability to earn premium reward tiers. These premium reward tiers only include cosmetics and premium 
currency. And premium currency can only be spent on cosmetics. But then on the free battle pass, you can unlock season boosts, like an XP boost. And they said, quote, We want to be clear that players can't unlock season boosts more quickly through purchases. There is no way to unlock more boosts or boosts at a faster pace by spending money. They also said, quote, Players can purchase tiers, but they won't speed up getting season boosts. Players can't upgrade season boosts just by purchasing tiers, because they'll also have to earn level milestones to apply them. All other tier bonuses can be unlocked instantly by purchasing tiers. In other words, there's no way to shortcut getting season boosts by buying tiers. They must be earned. So, we combine that with the Ultimate Edition selling 20 skip tiers, and it seems our answer is no, you are not buying power. Now, how does this work in practice? Well, probably, whatever you would need to do to earn a free boost at that point in your battle pass, you'll still end up doing by the time you reach that boost. For instance, maybe to get to a point on the battle pass where you earn your boost, you need to be level 50, and you can only use an XP boost if you have a level 50 character. This way, it doesn't matter if you paid to unlock those extra tiers, you still can't use the boost, and you still have to earn it. Also, in case you missed it, I got to play a Diablo 4 press beta for a week. Be sure to check out my video over here talking all about it, complete with gameplay footage. Also, we got some extra details on the musical performance that opened the Diablo 4 portion of the Game Awards. We mentioned in our video Thursday night that it was a performance by Halsey, and as it turns out, she's actually quite the Diablo fan. In a press release, she said, quote, As soon as Diablo 4 was announced, I knew I wanted to be a part of the lead-up and launch. Lilith is such an influence on my own art and has informed so many characteristics of my alter ego. My family has spent many hours together in Sanctuary over the years, so I'm here as a fan and as a collaborator. The Game Awards performance for the launch date announcement is just the beginning of what Blizzard Entertainment and I have in store. A lot of exciting things are coming for Halsey fans, Diablo fans, and the crossover, waiting for Lilith's embrace. Also, the song she performed was called Lilith, and was part of her 2021 album, If I Can't Have Love, I Want Power. So they didn't just grab some random popular artist, there is a deeper connection here to Diablo, to the franchise, and it seems that there'll be more of this collab coming in the future. Oh, and also, yes, I will acknowledge all the comments saying that D4 is releasing on 666, the sixth day of the sixth month in the year 2023. Two times three is six. Now, on to some less happy news about Diablo 4. The Washington Post has put out an article this week in which 15 current and former Blizzard employees spoke to them under anonymity to reveal some unpleasantries. The article came out before the Game Awards, and accurately stated that June 6th was the release date. The article goes on to say that employees said it'll be hard to meet that deadline without working significant overtime. Overall, the employees complained about mismanagement, that the Diablo team had been losing talent for over a year, that there was a lack of career progression at Blizzard or pay raises, and that a lot of the people leaving were people with decades of experience and institutional knowledge suggesting that the new employees brought in to replace them could not fill their shoes, not for lack of talent or ability, but just the specialized experience. And there was a suggestion that management was to blame for this, that more should have been done to prevent this talent from leaving. They went on to say that the Diablo 4 team leadership had trouble making decisions and sticking by them during development. The two former head honchos, Bariga and McCree, were blamed for frequently changing their minds about the game's direction, which apparently started to burn people out. Now, these two were fired in summer of 2021, during the height of Blizzard's culture controversy. And while it's assumed that their firing has to do with inappropriate behavior on their part, this has never been confirmed. Now, in this article, we also learned that Diablo 4 has had many internal unannounced release dates that got pushed back time and again. 2021 was originally an internal goal. By BlizzCon 2019, the goal was instead December 2022. But then devs begged for more time in order to avoid having to make massive cuts to the game, and that's when the April 2023 release date was decided. So, 
the leak from a week or two ago sounds like it was legit, it was just outdated information. Probably only outdated by a few months. Then the devs again felt like they needed more time and had the date moved to June 2023. Now that is public, that's been revealed at the Game Awards, we are now locked in. This means that Crunch will definitely be involved. Though this is no surprise in the gaming industry. From what the employees say, it seems that the crunch is not demanded or required, but it's heavily incentivized by promises of things like bonuses and extra stock options, things that are effectively so inviting that it's not really optional. So hopefully everything turns out well, but definitely sad to hear that the game has had a tumultuous development, if this is indeed the case, and that the devs still seem to feel like they want more time. I guess we'll find out on June 6th, because that's going to wrap up this week's video. But do be sure to check out last week's video, in which we discussed what appears to be a sixth leaked class for Diablo 4. Thanks for watching, special thanks to my Twitch, Patreon, and YouTube supporters for making these videos possible. If you like what you see on this channel and want to support the creation of more content, you can consider pledging on YouTube or Patreon, and unlocking behind the scenes content, monthly virtual hangouts, and more. If you enjoyed this video, please share it, check out these other videos, and subscribe to join Rikers Raiders for more gaming content.